So we have Palestine, stroke Israel, we have Syria, we have Iraq, all former Ottoman territories, arguably even Egypt, mm. which are in turmoil now as a result, perhaps, of the settlement that came out of the First World War. We don't really push the envelope. More like open it. This is Litopia, After Dark. The Net's first and foremost literary salon. A feast of ideas for your hungry mind. So pull up a chair and let's talk. Good evening and welcome to a special edition of Latopia After Dark. Now, as you know, we normally record on Sunday evenings here in London and invite listeners to join us live in the chat room. Well, we're doing neither tonight because our special guest is barely in London for 48 hours, here on a flying visit from his university post in Istanbul. I saw him give his only London lecture last night and it was quite simply one of the best talks on any subject I've ever seen. So here we are, recording on a rather dank Tuesday evening. And very fortunate that Professor Sean McMeekin can join us. Welcome, Sean. Well, thank you for having me, Peter. And we're also joined by keen amateur historian and former editor of the bookseller magazine, Neil Denny. Welcome, Neil. Welcome. Good to see you. Now, I used to think that I knew something about the causes of the Great War, uh, whose centenary is, of course, imminent. But your talk last night, Sean, persuaded me that I actually know nothing at all. The only way I can visualise it is this. In my head... I see a sort of punch-up in a Western saloon bar. One person throws a punch, and before you know what's happening, the whole place is brawling. Not for any one reason, but simply because it seemed like a good idea at the time. Sean, how right or wrong am I? It's not actually a bad way to describe it. Um, there was nothing inevitable about the war, if you actually look at the immediate causes. There was the obvious proximate cause in Sarajevo with the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand, but yeah. that event itself was so highly contingent. Um, there was a plot. There was absolutely a conspiracy. I mean, you could really look at July 1914, or more specifically, the, the 28th of June 1914, and you could very easily say that well, conspiracy theorists of the world unite. <laughs> You've got a conspiracy of at least seven Serbs. Well, all right, technically speaking, most of them were Bosnian Serbs. Okay, so you said last night, somebody gets shot in Sarajevo and Ger Germany invades... Belgium. Belgium. <laughs> there's a few links in between, though. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's kind of, Serbia is allied with Russia and... Mm, Serbia is... As, and then Russia declares war on Austria and then Austria is allied with Germany and... France is alive with... See, my head is spinning already. Yeah, it, it is a bit of a domino theory. It's just that a lot of the actors already had these kind of plans in place. They're responding to fast-moving events. On the other hand, um, they're not responding innocently. Um, you know, you had in the case of Austria-Hungary, you had a war minister, Konrad von Hützendorf, who had literally threatened to go to war with Serbia 25 times in 1913 alone. Oddly enough, the man who had blocked him every single one of those 25 times was the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, <laughs> the man who was, of course, assassinated. Now, there are various theories about the motivations of the Serbs. Were they working for the Russians? Uh, were they uh, supplied by these kind of pan-Slavist fringe groups or hate groups? What was their motivation? Did they realize that Archduke Franz Ferdinand was, in fact, the man who was blocking some of their ambitions because, in fact, you know, he was against the the pan-Slavist idea. The problem here, this is where the conspiracy theory breaks down. In fact, of course, intelligence was imperfect. Um, the Serbian terrorist groups, including the one we usually refer to as the Black Hand, a more literally translated union or death, was not literally funded by the Russians. Um, it was, however, headed by the chief of Serbian military intelligence, who was himself in very close contact with Russia's military attaché. Um, so there's smoke there. On the other hand, they didn't necessarily understand Austrian politics that well. Um, they didn't necessarily understand that the Archduke Franz Ferdinand was something of a pacifist by Austrian standards, that in fact, he was the one who kept blocking the war party. Uh, been, and he was the heir to the throne. He was the heir to the throne. Um, he had been the heir basically since the 1880s, although his uncle, the actual emperor Franz Joseph I, despised him. He hated him. Uh, not long before this, um, uh, 
he had had a kind of a stroke and everyone had been expecting him to die because he was now an octogenarian. Um, and supposedly Franz Ferdinand had a train ready to whisk him to the capital at a minute's notice. The, the, the gossip of the capital was that it was actually his desire to spite his jealous nephew that to which he owed his recovery because <laughs> he didn't want his nephew to sit on the throne um i mean the more you you spin it out the more fascinating and complicated it becomes. Look, i just want to take you back please because yeah. um i'm you know my head is still completely spinning and at the end of this i want it to be spinning somewhat less theories about the the way that a conflict like this could arise that involved every major power in the world killed what nine million combatants so the, the sort of the first theory, as I understand it, was AJP Taylor's theory that all these plans were well made, they were interlocking, and all that was required was the first domino to fall, and then everything just automatically kicked in, and we had a disaster on our hands. But subsequent to that, another historian, German historian actually, said, well, actually, no, it was really a cunning plan by the Germans. Well, cunning is, um, I think, a particularly bad way to describe any well, kind of enough. German approach to what happened in 1914. I fully understand where somebody like Fritz Fischer was coming from. This is the historian who in 1961, to some extent, revolutionized literature and the origins of the war by pointing to these large-scale German ambitions uh, regarding the East, uh, particularly, but not exclusively, the Ottoman Empire, yeah. regarding provinces in Eastern Europe, Russia, and so on. German ambitions, even Western Europe, that the Germans had all of these plans. Um, now, Fischer spins an impressive web around this notion of German war aims. You know, there are several problems there with the theory uh, when it attempts to explain events in 1914. The first of which is that the Germans were not the first to mobilize. They were, in fact, the last of the four principal powers to mobilize. That is, they mobilized after the Russians, after the French, after the Austro-Hungarians. They certainly had plans. They had discussions. They had talk. They had uh, this notorious mobilization plan. Usually, or it used to be referred to as the Schlieffen Plan, after Count Alfred von Schlieffen, although more recently uh, some specialists have begun to question the notion there really ever was an immutable Schlieffen plan, that it really was more of a kind of a war game designed to tease out extra funding from the Reichstag because the Germans didn't have enough troops to make it work. And was the plan basically um, to, to knock the French out and then attack the Russians? That's right. Uh, the plan was that Germany was expecting that Russia, because of her vast uh, spaces, the vast distances involved, that Russia would mobilize slowly enough that Germany would have time, roughly six weeks, to knock France out. Um, therefore, there are cruder versions of this that simplify it to something like Paris by day 40 or 42. The plan was never anywhere near that precise. However, the basic notion was true. The Germans expected that they could, at least in theory, knock out France or at least neutralize the French threat in time to spin around and face the Russians. Now, these plans have been, of course, altered a number of times before 1914. In fact, uh, Helmut von Moltke, we usually refer to him as Moltke the Younger, the chief of the German general staff, had more recently adjusted the plan in several notable directions, one of which actually involved, of all things, Holland. The original scheme of von Schlieffen was actually to violate Dutch territory in addition to Belgian territory. It was actually a very broad sweep, as the phrase had it, uh, let the last man on the right brush the English Channel with his sleeve. Um, maybe lacking the courage of his convictions, Moltke had some doubts that it would really work, and so he thought that Holland, in particular the ports of Holland, would be important in the case the war turned into a long war of attrition, and so he didn't want the Dutch to be entered in the ranks of Germany's enemies. Um, so he kept weakening the right wing. But still, the plan, as many military plans are, was based on assumptions which were becoming out of date. The Russian mobilization was speeding up every year. And this, incidentally, is, is a large part of the case, supposedly, for the German plot, or German war guilt, is that the Germans were afraid that Russia was becoming too strong, and that's why they wanted to fight 1914. You flip this around, though, and you can see that German calculations were actually increasingly out of date. And... In a certain sense, the Germans really were trapped into things in 1914. That is, it was not at all their idea scenario. It was actually more like a worst-case scenario that virtually came true. Um, that is, the scenario did not work to Germany's advantage mm -hmm. at all. 
And one has to wonder what the German war aims were. I mean, why actually start the war? How could they hope to gain, particularly? What were they actually after? I mean, well, right. what, what were they clearly looking for? You look at this, the notion that the whole war was a German plot breaks down as soon as you grasp the basics of the strategic equation of 1914. The Germans ended up at war with Britain, France, and Russia, three colossal countries, which essentially had German... It's obviously a failure of diplomacy, but it's not at all the ideal scenario. I mean, if you're looking from the perspective of Berlin, this is a nightmare. It's an absolute disaster. A war with France and Russia was at least plausible, and the Germans knew they had to reckon with it. But the idea that Britain would come in, too, was the ultimate nightmare. And well, they'd beaten the, the French in 1870, and, you know, the Russians were a weak power, but the British, an island with a strong navy, almost impregnable from the German point of view. Well, yeah, the Chancellor, Bethmann Holweg, had spent most of his career as, as regards foreign policy trying to forge a kind of rapprochement with Britain. Um, now, ultimately, he obviously failed, but he had actually invested a huge amount of his political capital. You know, the the scene when, when it finally becomes clear to the Germans that everything has kind of gone wrong and that Britain has issued this ultimatum about the Germans having to, this is on, on the 3rd of August. Into August, yeah, to, to yeah. leave Belgium or... That's right, to yeah. leave Belgium or else. He actually calls in the British ambassador and the way he describes it, he says, well, Britain is like... You know, it's like, to get back to the bar analogy, you know, it's like there's a man who's being attacked by two assailants and Britain comes in and stabs him in the back with a knife. That's actually the way Bethmann Holweg described and Britain's intervention. The, the two leaders were cousins, the king and the kaiser. That's right. So The British Navy was training with the German Navy until they, they very near the beginning of the war. Maneuvers in Kiel, a kind of almost a rapprochement between the two fleets. You know, from the German perspective, it was kind of a shock. Now, admittedly, the army planners had had to reckon on the possibility. I mean, one of the paradoxes is that actually the Germans, to some extent, were more realistic about the threat of British intervention, at least if you look at the army, than was even the British cabinet, you know, had been to some extent kept in the dark about things. Um, you know, Sir Edward Grey was kind of playing dumb right up to the end. And to some extent, he was actually being sincere, you know, that is, he really didn't know the full extent of Britain's interoperational plans with France. But you look at this and, and you can kind of see the German perspective, you know, why would Britain intervene on the side of France and Russia? Why did it make sense for Britain to do And they never had serious way? plans to invade Britain. I mean, you know, even all oh, through the trenches, absolutely it was never a German war aim to, you know, to occupy England. No, no, they had to reckon with the possibility of a small-scale British expeditionary force, and that was definitely factored into the calculations of the German general staff. But at the level of politics, Bethmann Holweg in the Foreign Office, were absolutely keen to keep Britain out and they were a bit shocked when Britain went in. So do you think the Germans were kind of dragged into the war by mistake uh, because the Austrians got entangled in this Bosnian kind of, you know, tit-for-tat situation with the Russians and then they felt that they might as well go in now because, you know, their ally was going to fight with them against the Russians and it was now or never. Was it as simple as that? Not quite as simple, but you're actually on the right track because the Germans, um, the, the notorious so-called blank check with the Germans are offered Austria. This is when there was a mission sent to Berlin. Um, it was interesting. It was basically the kind of uh, chief of staff or chef de cabinet of the Austrian foreign minister, a man called Count Hoyos, who was Hungarian. And he was sent to Berlin in part because he had, he had a reputation as a hawk. You know, there were hawks in Vienna, just like there were in Berlin, just like there were in Petersburg, just like there were in Paris. He was sent there by the foreign minister, uh, Count Berthold, because Hoyos had a reputation as a hawk, and his job was actually to convince the Germans that for once the Austrians were not going to mess around, for once they were actually going to act decisively against Serbia. Now, the trick there, the problem was that on the one hand, he had no real authority to speak for the Austrian government, and the Austrian ambassador to uh, to Germany, that is, who was resident in Berlin, was was another Hungarian, you know, who was also he was kind of almost scheduled for retirement. They were trying as hard as they could to convince the Germans that they were really serious, that they really wanted to fight serving. The Germans were not initially ready to believe them. In fact, the perspective from Berlin was that the Austrians they kept messing up, that they were all talk. Uh, as Americans might say, all hat and no cattle. That is, that they would never actually carry through on their threats. So the Germans were just keen to get the Austrians to finally do something. Um, whether or not they understood that this meant 
you know, unleashing the Austrians and all their blundering incompetence is, of course, another question. But to the extent the Austrians, for their part, thought about things, you know, they seem to think that if Russia might intervene on behalf of Serbia, well, the Germans will handle it. You know, this is where this this idea of a plot being hatched in Vienna or Berlin finally breaks down, as there was virtually no coordination between Vienna and Berlin. When you look at the correspondence, you discover that, in fact, there was this incredible dis- disconnect. The Germans were just as shocked well, to learn... You know, I'll flip this around. The Austrians were just as shocked to learn that Germany planned basically to invade Belgium, <laughs> that is, as opposed to concentrating your forces against Russia. As the Germans, for their part, were shocked when they eventually learned, and this is on the 28th of July, that Austria had declared war on Serbia, because they had actually been assured that Austria would, uh, they wanted Austria to fight. They kept saying they wanted, but the Austrian chief of staff, the equivalent of Moltke, Konrad, had actually told the Germans, well, look, we're not going to be ready until August 12th. So the Germans were actually expecting that Austria, initially they were hoping that Austria would act decisively, basically before the other powers could react. By the end of July, it had become clear the Austrians were not at all ready to act. In fact, they were dithering just as usual, and they really weren't even going to be ready to invade Serbia until August 12th. And in fact, the chief of staff, Conrad, the one who was so keen to invade Serbia, he didn't even want to declare war on Serbia because he thought it made no sense. He said, well, look... You know, Japan didn't declare war on Russia in 1904. They just attacked. It makes no sense to declare war before you actually make war. But the Austrian foreign minister, in effect, this is Bertold, by the end of July, he was just kind of getting a little bit exhausted by the drama. He literally didn't want to answer his phone. That's pretty much the size of it. He had gotten sick of answering his phone. Everyone was coming in with mediation plans, and he no longer wanted mediation. He wanted war. And so he said, well, look, we'll just declare war, and then they can't call me up on the phone anymore. In the sequence of events, did the French then come in to support the Russians and declare war on Germany? Or did, or did the Germans declare war on France because they had already declared war on Russia? Well, it's an interesting question because the Germans were the last to mobilize, but oddly the first to declare war. This they had in common with the Austrians. The Germans, the one thing you have to remember about them in the 20th century, very good at war, very bad at diplomacy. <laughs> they simply did not understand the importance of theatrics and kind of arranging the perception of the outbreak of the war. <clears throat> last to mobilize but the first to declare war. Russia was clever enough to wait until Germany had declared war to, of course, retaliate, whereas, in fact, Russia had inaugurated her own pre-mobilization measures a Let whole me, week I, 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 want to ask, I want to ask you about that. So, you know, in the dock, Russia, not guilty as... Uh, Germany, not guilty as charged. And of course, that led on to... Well, one. guilty of certain things, just not what you do. <laughs> Germany is charged not with. Not guilty of causing the First World War. <laughs> right. Um, and obviously, that went on to, led on to Versailles and reparations and everything else we know about. But Russia, though, last night in your talk, you were pointing an accusatory finger at Russia, saying there was malice aforethought there. There was. I mean, one shouldn't go too far here. Um, there is no smoking gun, for example, which proves that... Russia was in any way complicit with the plot in Sarajevo. Uh, There's a bit of smoke even there, admittedly. It's not a smoking gun. Um, But the Russian military attaché, Viktor Artamonov, uh, was actually in very close contact with Dmitrievich. This is Apis, the notorious chief of Serbian military intelligence. Interestingly, he was actually interviewed about this after the war by an Italian journalist called Luigi Albertini. Albertini, who produced these three phenomenal volumes on the war back, it was actually in the 1930s, although the English translation didn't come out to the 1950s. Now, what he told Albertini, he told him several things, which uh, you can try to make of them what you will. On the one hand, he said, well, I had nothing to do with it because I wasn't there. I was on vacation. And apparently this is true. He was not in Sarajevo on the 28th of June. Um, it's curious he wasn't there, though, because he was Russia's official military observer in Serbia, and Franz Ferdinand was actually sent there, that is, the Archduke, the heir to the throne, to observe Austrian military maneuvers, which you might think Austrian military maneuvers in Bosnia would be of interest to Russia's official military observer in Serbia. Apparently he was, however, out of town. He did, however, admit, he confessed, pretty strongly that it was true that in Belgrade there were no real secrets. That is, that small town, there are only a few cafes that everyone went to and everyone gossiped. So 
basically everyone knew something was up. In fact, Serbia's prime minister, Nikolai Pasic, uh, was aware of the plot and apparently tried to warn the Austrians about it because effectively there was a faction, there was a kind of extreme nationalist faction, you know, led by the chief of Serbian, again, army intelligence, so we usually call him APIS, his kind of code name. You know, and they were trying to either put pressure on the government, to topple the government, there was talk of a coup d'etat, and the prime minister was in a he was in a difficult bind. He, on the one hand, could not necessarily come out openly against this plot. On the other hand, he didn't want it to succeed because Serbia was only recovering from the Balkan Wars. She'd fought in both of the Balkan Wars, and Serbia didn't really want a war at that time. I mean, amusingly enough, of course, the Serbs did actually very well against the Austria in the war that actually did begin. But they, of course, were not particularly keen to begin a war with Austria at the time. So there's a lot of mixed motivation there. The Russians clearly knew something was afoot. Um, they had pretty good intelligence, very good intelligence in Belgrade. And immediately after the news came in, you know, a couple of things. It's, it's difficult to tease out Russian intentions in part because there's a bit of a myth that the Germans all burned their papers from July 1914. There may be some private papers which have disappeared, but in fact, the German and Austrian official records are extremely voluminous. There's almost nothing missing. In the Russian files, there are huge gaps. Sazonov's memoirs basically skip right from the accusation until four weeks later. There's nothing in between. If you look at the documents, um, Russia's ambassador to Paris, Alexander Izvolsky, who was a real super uber hawk, um, there's nothing in, in his secret correspondence. The, the so-called Lee Noir black book of his correspondence published after the war. It's voluminous, but there's this huge gap you know, between 28th of June and, you know, three or four weeks into June, uh, sorry, into July. And so there are huge gaps in our knowledge. I mean, the little we can puzzle out, though, is that the Russians understood much more keenly than anyone, for example, in London or in Paris, just how serious the news was. Um, we know, for example, Serbia had been requesting an arms shipment from Russia for months. It was approved on the 30th of June, that is two days after the assassination. We know that Sazonov, uh, this is something I mentioned in my talk, uh, issued this directive uh, to Russia's equivalent of Chief of Naval Staff. The title is slightly different. Uh, Grigorovich is his name, it's effectively the naval minister, asking for the latest information on the war readiness of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, uh, the job of which was basically to prepare amphibious operations against Constantinople and the Straits. So, there's, again, there's smoke here. It's hard so, to kind of make the dots all connect. So do you think the Russians are trying to provoke an attack by the Austrians? Is it as simple as that? So they can provoke, they can support the assassination, provoke the attack, and then be the injured party and then wage war on the Austrians and hopefully win? I think that's, that's putting it... Is that a bit strong? A, a bit strong because, um, again, here is the paradox. Sazonov was very cagey about this, both in the documents and the memoirs. The one thing he said, though, was that if the European war broke out, that everyone basically in Russia's general staff, naval staff, government, etc., expected that an offensive against Constantinople, that is Istanbul, was inevitable. It was something they wanted. On the other hand, Russia had been burned before in the past. The diplomacy mattered greatly. In 1877, Russia had invaded Turkey. This is the so-called Russo-Ottoman War. However, ultimately, even though no one intervened at first, a kind of coalition had developed against Russia. That is, Russia had no diplomatic support. In the Balkan Wars, or even in the Bosnian crises before the First World War, there had not been overt diplomatic support for Russia or her position. So that in this sense, I don't think it was a plot in the sense that Russia actually designed or provoked it. Russia took advantage of the situation, however. Now, you can obviously say the Germans, to some extent, did too in trying to, uh, to, to urge on the Austrians, but Russia was presented now... Did they the miscalculate, though? Did they miscalculate and not assume... Did they assume that the Germans wouldn't come in with the Austrians? Did, I mean, presumably that... They didn't want to fight a war against the, no. the Turks, the Austrians, and the Germans. See, this, this is what's funny. I actually think the Russians calculated perfectly. If you look at the chatter in the Russian command, some of this admittedly is coming from the circles outside of the Russian government. But there's a notion... Um, uh, one of the Russian Panslavists were uh, national liberals, as they were sometimes called. Uh, this is Trubetskoy had actually said quite literally, and you'll have to follow me here. The logic might not seem obvious to you, but it's a direct quote that the road to Constantinople led through Warsaw. Uh, 
Now, geographically, that's nonsense, of course. <laughs> that is, Warsaw effectively kind of halfway in between uh, the German and the Austrian fronts. Interestingly, though, this, this might sound like mere rhetoric and chatter, but the chief of, not the general staff, the actual, his, his technical command is quartermaster general, but he's actually in charge of drawing up Russia's mobilization plans. His name was Yuri Danilov. Danilov put it even more strongly. He said that the road to Constantinople led through Vienna and Berlin. Okay. okay. So what that meant was that a war with Germany and Austria was actually in Russia's interest. A precondition to taking Constantinople. And I had a question which came up last night in my mind as I was sitting watching you expose the Russian obsession with Constantinople and the need for a blue water port mm. so they can get their Black Sea fleet out. But all of this, I was thinking, well, this is all well and good. They can get through the Dardanelles, but they're just going to be bottled up by the British at, at Gibraltar. Mm. I mean, they just get into the Mediterranean. So why the obsession with Constantinople? Well, right. I suppose they were they were at least uh, assuming British friendship if they could get through. Okay. Well, but you see, it wasn't just Constantinople. In fact, they thought they thought through all the the peculiarities of the problem. Uh, in fact, the kind of uh, what we might call white papers, the Russian equivalent of white papers, drawn up on the straits. They all specified that, in fact, control of Constantinople itself was not enough. That Russia needed the literal. That is, they needed the European and Asian shorelines. So all the land around the Sea of Marmara. All the land around the Sea of Marmara basically down and even outside the mouth of the Dardanelles, including some of the islands in the Aegean, which, of course, guarded the mouth, that, in fact, Russia needed sovereign control of the four principal islands as well. And that was formulated quite clearly during the war. It's not at all hard to kind of trace the lineage of this discussion into actual concrete war aims. And, and this was because they felt that the Ottoman Empire was weak and that now was a good time to attack? I mean, could you could you frame the First World War's outbreak as a reaction to the weakness of the Ottomans yeah, it, that, that provoked mm. Russian greed, and that led to the the scheming with the Serbs, and that ultimately that sucked in the Austrians and then the Germans? Well, it's tricky because the Russians would oscillate back and forth. Pure Ottoman weakness in the sense of the Ottomans being able to be manipulated and controlled was not actually a bad thing for Russia. The problem with the Balkan Wars is that they had posed the possibility of several things happening. Ottoman weakness might have drawn in other powers. You had, first of all, the Bulgarians, who actually came very close to conquering the city. They had their own plans to conquer Constantinople. Ferdinand of Bulgaria referred to himself as the Tsar, and he had a Byzantine emperor's regalia in his closet. Um, there were, of course, other powers which potentially might have even threatened Constantinople, Greece, for example, or Serbia. So the Russians, the last thing they wanted was for some new ambitious young power to take over control of the straits. There was also the possibility that a weakened Ottoman Empire might have been taken in hock by the Germans. There was a German military mission under Limon von Sanders, which was dispatched to help train the Ottoman army in December 1913, precipitating a huge diplomatic crisis, which very nearly provoked the war in January of 1914. And there, the Russian fear would have been just quite literally that control of access to the straits would have fallen into German hands. So when they're thinking through all of this, again, they're not necessarily averse to the idea of a kind of weak, decrepit Ottoman Empire that they could control. That's what they'd had for most of the 19th century, which to some extent had worked out okay for Russia. The problem was that the, the, basically the fact that Ottoman problems were now thrust into the foreground meant that all these other scenarios were threatening them. You know, they, they weren't sure how it would turn out, but basically what they thought was some crisis would precipitate a war, and that's when Russia would have to make her claim. So we have all this, these machinations of great power politics on the eastern half of, of, of Europe. And of course, the question sitting here in London, as we are, is why Britain got dragged into this. I mean, yes, they were allies of the French, um, but beyond that, it's hard to see what our national interest was. Well, even calling in Britain of, allies of the French is questionable. Um, in terms of getting involved in, a, in a, what became a disastrously expensive European war for the British. I mean, what really was the British government thinking in July and August 1914? I mean, it looks like a classic mistake. We should have been the guys, going back to your borrow analogy, standing at the side holding the coats. Yeah. We should not have got sucked in, you know. No, I, I, I don't agree at all with, uh, I mean, I don't disagree at all with your line of thinking. Um, as far as what everyone was thinking in the British government, I think to some extent the problem is many of them weren't thinking. Sir Edward Grey is really at the center of the storm, and yet 
you know, he's, uh, I'm not going to say he's quite senile at the time, but I mean, he's literally losing his eyesight in the summer of 1914. Um, his basic plan for the summer before this crisis hit was oddly enough to go to Germany, where he wanted to have his eyes checked. Um, because, well, he basically his real passion in life was fly fishing, and he was afraid he wouldn't really be able to pursue it anymore. So while he could still... In fact, this is actually his priority right after the, the Sarajevo incident. He, he doesn't want it to interrupt his schedule because he doesn't know how, how much time he has left you know, to fly fish, basically. Oh, the, 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 season is running out. That's right, the season is running out. His eyes are running out. You know, the hourglass of time is running out. Oh, that's strangely reassuring. You know, he's, I mean, this is the funny thing. is Everyone knows this story about the famous story where he says that the lights in Europe are being extinguished and we one don't by know. one you know, one yeah, by one yeah. but to his eyesight they probably were they yeah. were I mean yeah. he's looking at the street lights and his eyes are literally glazing over because he really was not he was just not really with it he was not fully on the ball I mean he served Britain very very badly he had no idea what was going on in Russia he had no idea what was going on in the Balkans um, to some extent I mean not everything he was saying about Germany and Austria was necessarily wrong it's just that he wasn't paying any attention to what anyone else was doing. He didn't realize the way he was getting played by France. He had no idea the Russians were mobilizing. And this is true of most of Britain's diplomats. Sir George Buchanan, who is Britain's kind of eyes on the ground in Russia, whether through malice or ignorance and incompetence, uh, simply says virtually nothing about what happens in Russia the last week of July 1914. To the extent he said anything, he kept telling the Russians, you better not give the Germans a pretext by you know, pre-mobilizing or mobilizing. The Russians did absolutely everything he warned them not to do, and yet he just paid no attention. Um, you know, so back in England, I mean, oddly enough, the initial kind of diplomatic forays that Gray made as far as mediation, the only ones who responded positively were actually the Germans, <laughs> but he didn't pay attention to that either. It's partly because he kept changing his tack. Um, you know, initially he wanted some sort of mediation between Austria and Russia, and the Germans obviously were perfectly keen on that. And, so he was the prime minister, um, was he, Gray? No, no, Gray was, uh, he was his majesty's foreign secretary. Okay. Asquith was not directly involved. He was the prime minister in part because, well, everyone was obsessed with home rule at the time. Yeah. I mean, Ireland was really dominating the news cycle in England, and so that was part of the problem is everyone's thinking about that. They're not thinking about the Balkans. They're not really thinking about, they're certainly not thinking about Russia. Um, and as far as France, I mean, this is, Again, there's there's just so little concrete, hard information about who exactly knew what and when, because it seems that Gray himself was not even aware. The, the, His Majesty's Foreign Secretary himself was not aware of the full extent of the nature of this inter-allied cooperation, now, that is, the plans for the dispatch of an expeditionary force to France. He knew something. Mostly what he knew about, though, was actually... The naval issue, that is, that they had, they had divided uh, the seas up into spheres of influence. France, uh, crudely speaking, France was to handle the Mediterranean and England was to handle the Channel. Um, you know, and this had been negotiated with um, the, the French ambassador back in 1912. The cabinet, oddly enough, had been brought in, at least to some extent on this, even some of the kind of little Englanders in the cabinet, you know, people like Lord Morley, they knew to some extent that there was some kind of a naval agreement with France. Of course, they had been told that it was non-binding. They had been told that it did not commit England, obviously, to any sort of interventionist policy. You know, whether they had been lied to or whether, again, it was just a matter of ignorance and incompetence, I mean, that is, I think, an open question. But it had ultimately, I mean, as you look at Gray's speech to the Commons, this is actually what he's getting at. You know, it takes him almost an hour to warm up, and he's just meandering all over the place. I mean, at one point in his speech, his case for British intervention rests on the notion that because Britain has left the Mediterranean bereft, basically left it up to France, that, that Italy might pose a threat to Britain's shipping interests in the Mediterranean. That's actually his case for war. It's absurd. It's laughable, yeah. It's absolutely laughable. I mean, eventually, it was almost so much impatience in the room with how absurd this is. I mean, there's some you know, kind of chatter from the back benches that he ultimately says, well, well, Gladstone told us about something about the, the dire crime, the moral sin, you know, alluding to Belgium. Um, you know, here's where the, the Germans just basically fell right into this trap. You know, this is the only way they could have brought Britain into the war. Was to invade by, the neutral Belgium. Yeah, to and invade that, Belgium. But there'd been a, a naval arms race between the British and the Germans throughout the Edwardian true, period. True, true. And was there a kind of popular 
kind of demand for war almost to kind of resolve this. There was a kind of gradual building up of an anti-German feeling in in, in well, Britain in in the ten years. That's true. Up to the I war. mean, you can see it in sort of the what the thirty nine steps of John Buchan, among other places. There was a kind of building popular hysteria. Well, R- about Riddle the of the Sands is another one. Yeah, Riddle of the Sands. I mean, you can see it in popular culture. You can see it in the press. There was again this kind of almost popular notion that I suppose you can say the public had to some extent been been sold on this idea that Britain and Germany were at least potentially enemies. But, but if you we look, were even thinking, the liberals in Parliament, they thought it was absurd. Most but we were thinking, the public was thinking in yeah. 19th century terms of warfare. And the right. problem, problem is this is a 20th century war with untold casualties. Yeah. So as, as the war progresses, as this conflagration just ignites and takes off all over Europe, let's just pull back a little bit, look, look at the, the overall map. Who called the shots in the best way? Who, who strategically was the most astute and who was the most stupid? Well, I think the Russians were actually the most astute. This is, again, it's going to sound paradoxical. We all know that it ends badly for Russia with her revolution. But diplomatically speaking, the Russians held all the cards. Um, I mean, France and Britain was ultimately kind of dragged in, I mean, almost literally just side by side with France, were faced with the fact that the oddities of German strategic planning meant that they had sent, you know, basically seven-eighths of their available strength on the Western Front. Um, This was, again, this dilemma they faced in the two-front war. So the Russians essentially could have done whatever they wanted in 1914. There's an argument that, in fact, if they had sold out their French allies entirely, that is, if they they, they didn't need to invade East Prussia at all. They could have just basically devoted the entirety of their strength against Austria-Hungary. They would have reached the Carpathian Mountains and the Austro-Hungarians, the Habsburg Empire would have essentially fallen apart. In the end, I suppose it was kind of the the disaster of the half measure that the Russians really had no particular desire to invade East Prussia. What they really wanted was to knock out Austria-Hungary. This, for reasons, some of them sentimental, uh, some of them ideological. Uh, The Russians were claiming, for example, that in Austrian Galicia, there was this population of, you know, as they called them, little Russians, uh, Ruthenians. Philo Russian, Ruthenians. Yeah, Philo Russians, yeah. yeah, Ruthenians yeah. were, were just waiting for the Russians to liberate them. And there was, a, I mean, a small grain of truth in that there was some welcoming of the Russian armies. There was by the, the one day population. republic, wasn't there, with Ruthenia, that lasted <laughs> really? a single day. Yeah. <laughs> lasted a day. Yeah. They had to keep switching, uh, you know, borders and rulers throughout the 20th century. Um, France, of course, was desperate for the Russians to make a direct front assault on Berlin, and the Russians just never had any interest in doing that. So why do the... I mean, the question that you touched on last night, but it's worth re- reiterating briefly, is is given that Constantinople was the Russian obsession, yeah. they never actually really seriously attacked Constantinople in the entire First World War. They spent a lot of time and effort attacking, you know, East Prussia and yeah. further north, but they never well, they actually... they waited until 1917. ...got to grips. <laughs> you know, not a good year if you're a Russian general, perhaps, you know. Not a good year. Uh, they did eventually get there, but it, yeah, it was not in full strength, and it was not until 1917. Well, I mean, obviously, you had the initial conundrum that the Ottoman Empire had not entered the war. <laughs> that was the biggest obstacle. The Russians, I suppose, were assuming either that they would or that there would be some crisis which would give them a pretext. Because the, uh, the Ottomans didn't side with the, Aust- the Austrians and the Germans immediately, is that No, correct? they, they, didn't. they I mean, declared even war the, a little bit later. This is another way in which the Germans were amazingly incompetent at diplomacy. They signed an alliance treaty with the Ottomans on the 2nd of August 1914. This is actually before technically the war with France begins, before Britain is in the war. And yet the treaty was worded in such a way. I mean, if you actually read all of Germany's treaties, not even Austria-Hungary was obliged to come to Germany's aid. <laughs> Basically, the, the Germans had this problem where, on the one hand, you've got this Germanic propriety. And if you read the Hague Convention quite literally, it says you're not supposed to initiate hostilities before declaring war. And for some reason, Bethmann Holweg was hung up on this. And so he insisted on declaring war first, not on mobilizing first. And what this meant was that literally his allies were off the hook. Because according to the terms of Germany's treaties with Austria-Hungary, Italy... Romania, and then this new treaty with the Ottoman Empire, they were not, in fact, obliged to declare war on Germany's enemies because Germany had declared war first. Italy, in the end, wiggled out famously and joined the other side. Austria-Hungary actually waited until the 6th of August to declare war on Russia, even though the entire crisis in the first place was about Austria and Russia. The usual argument is that this proves the kind of notion of German war guilt because they pushed Austria into declaring war. It actually proves the incompetence of German diplomacy. So the Ottomans got everything they could out of this new treaty. 
you know, the Germans promised that they would, you know, not only defend Ottoman territorial integrity in the case of war, they would help the Ottomans regain lost provinces from recent wars like the Balkan Wars, the war with Italy, the war with Russia in 1877. But meanwhile, the Ottomans were under no legal obligation to declare war on Russia, which the Germans understandably assumed they would. They delayed for several months. I mean, there was literally a bidding war over Ottoman belligerence or neutrality. And the Germans, in the end, really, they, they won that war in the only way they knew how, which was not really diplomatic skill. It was a kind of bludgeoning. You know, on the one hand, you had the bribes of gold arriving in Constantinople. In the end, two million pounds of gold. And the Ottomans insisted that it be literally present physically in the city before they would launch war against Russia. And then literally just by this German... Admiral Wilhelm Souchon, who, you know, famously led um, the German dreadnought SMS Gerben on this voyage where he kept escaping the British and arrived somewhat miraculously in Ottoman territorial waters. Souchon, in the end, to some extent, even exceeded his orders and actually led an attack on Russian ports to pretty much, I mean, as, as he later put it in his memoirs, to force the Turks, even against their will, to declare war on Russia. Um, you know, that is, to some extent, it was the Germans and even the Russians, in a perverse sense, who wanted the Ottomans to enter the war in some ways more than the Ottomans did. It was only a couple of belligerent members of the Ottoman government who actually wanted the war. There was actually a lot of resistance inside the Ottoman government to risking everything. And the key point about Gallipoli was that uh, the British invaded Gallipoli to attack Constantinople, assuming a Russian, or in belief that the Russians would mount a similar attack from the other side, yeah. from the Black Sea side, and for whatever reason, that didn't happen. Well, it wasn't the just Russians an kind assumption. of sat on their hands. Exactly, it wasn't and the British just, uh, got bogged down. And you know, they it was one of the huge and worst defeats of the war for the British. It was. It, it the way you're putting it is, of course, quite logical. But it was more than an assumption or belief. I mean, it was literally an inter-allied agreement. The Russians, uh, the Russian Black Sea Fleet, actually accepted. It took a while for them to accept the overall command of first. Uh, first Cardin and then Durobek, that is the, essentially the British commander of, of the Mediterranean fleet, they accepted their overall command. They promised. In fact, they were supposed to, according to Churchill's own terms, formulated back in January of 1915, Russia was supposed to strike at the outer shore defenses, shore batteries of the Bosporus, that is from the northern approaches to Constantinople, uh, simultaneous with the British reduction of the outer forts of the Dardanelles, that is at the southern end. It was actually an inter-allied agreement uh, that Russia violated, quite literally. This is, in fact, one of the oddest things to me if you read Churchill's memoirs. I fully understand Churchill's need, to some extent, to explain the campaign, to make it make sense. And and he's by no means to blame you know, for everything in the way that, that it all kind of transpired. Churchill was initially against the idea of a naval-only strike. He said, no, we need ground troops. And then essentially he was told by Kitchener, no ground troops would be available, so deal with what you have. And then once they tried and they got very close by the 18th of March, you know, Churchill actually said, well, we should push on with the naval-only attack, even though that wasn't originally his idea. And you know, then he was overruled and you know, told, no, we have to wait for ground troops to clear it. You know, so I understand his kind of bitterness and where he's coming from. But the, the honest thing is that he just doesn't blame the Russians. You know, he, he gets to this point where I suppose after 1917, there's this kind of almost gallant pity for Russia. Russia had this terrible revolution, our gallant allies bled and so on and so forth. And there are these lines about the Russian gallantry and Russia bleeding. I think there was a <laughs> guilt from the British establishment that they hadn't oh, provided uh, a refuge for the Tsar. Because yeah. he had asked the king to come that's to true. London and the king had refused because he was worried that he would be seen as a German and dragged down too. So poor old Tsar was left to be shot in, in, right. in by, the, by the, the, the Bolsheviks. And I think that really influenced the way that the Russians were seen after the war by the British establishment. You're absolutely right. There, there was a sense of guilt, uh, regret, and kind of longing, and obviously just this general sense of kind of uh, a sort of nostalgia also for the Tsarist regime that kicked in, where it's a little bit like you don't speak ill of the dead. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Once the Tsarist regime was dead, you didn't want to speak ill of them. But, of course, in the context of 1915, Churchill's remarks about, you know, kind of Russia bleeding dry and all the rest of it are absolutely grotesque if you actually look at the Gallipoli campaign. Mm -hmm. You know, one way you can look at it is that, you know, if you look at the losses on the Allied side, 
um, you're you're talking about at least what fifty, fifty six something thousand dead. You talk about not just the wounded, you know, but those who came down with diseases of various sorts and were sent back to Alexandria. So to more contextualize than 100, that, that's more than the Americans lost in the Vietnam War. Absolutely, and Russia contributed so little to this campaign designed to win her the greatest prize of the First World War that no one bothered to count up her casualties. So, Sean, you've written a couple of books on this period, um, at least two books, actually. Most recent one is The Russian Origins of the First World War. I'm wondering what, what it is you personally find so fascinating about, about this period. Is it just its Byzantine, if you'll excuse the pun, its Byzantine complexity? Mm-hmm. What do you relate to? Well, that's an interesting question because it's true. Your your average uh, a British uh, chronicler or historian or Australian, I suppose you might say even more strongly about Australians or New Zealand types. When when you look at this, there's usually some kind of a family connection, you know, and that's true. I don't have ancestors who fought in the campaign. Um, I don't really have a personal connection to the First World War. I mean, even at the at the loosest extent, you might say I have kind of cousins several times removed who fought in the Second World War. That is, I don't have a personal connection to the story. Um, why I'm so fascinated? I mean, that, that in itself is a question I'm, I'm still coming to grips with. Some of it must come from simply moving to Turkey. I mean, I do think that moving to Turkey 10 years ago you know, has brought home to me in a way that I probably didn't previously understand. You know, I've visited the war memorials of Europe. I've been to Verdun, for example. You know, I've been to the British War Museum. I've been to all the French museums. So, you know, I know the kind of, the basic story of, you know, the awful, colossal war of attrition, the number of lives lost in the meat grinder of the Western Front. You can still I, feel the atmosphere in Verdun. Can't you can you? feel it's it in Verdun. I mean, that was probably the first time which I had really kind of had an emotional connection to the subject. Mm. But the connection in Turkey is somewhat different. I mean, it's a little bit like the war there is still alive, maybe in, in a way that it's not quite so much in the West. You know, in Britain, it's alive in memory, but mm. it doesn't really affect anyone's life. It doesn't affect the map, certainly. It doesn't affect current politics. Um, you know, in Turkey, there's still a lot of burning questions, or I suppose you might say more broadly in the former Ottoman Empire, including the, the broader Middle East, there's still burning questions to do with the legacy of the First World War, the, you know, which again, I increasingly see just in broad interpretive terms as something of a war of the Ottoman succession. So we have Palestine, stroke Israel, mm-hmm. we have Syria, we have Iraq, all former Ottoman territories, arguably even Egypt, Mm. which are in turmoil now as a result, perhaps, of the settlement that came out of the First World War. Well, let's not forget the former Yugoslavia. Well, indeed, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. That's just just in Asia, yeah. Keep going, that's just in Asia. Um, This whole whole region of the world, you know, which is still to some extent living down this legacy of the Great War. Um, And do you think Turkey is, obviously they were shorn of the empire in 1918 and... They are now more, after a century nearly, of, 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 of quiescence, perhaps, arguably, and now becoming slightly more assertive in foreign policy terms. Is, are they kind of re, re- discovering that Ottoman heritage, do you think? Is there a, a sense that they've, they've now got over the First World War and they're thinking more about their historic role as the power yeah. broker? In the Middle East. Well, certainly anyone in Turkey's government would give you a kind of official denial of neo-Ottomanism, but there's obviously something there. I'm not sure how well it plays out necessarily yet in the strategic realm. It's partly because they're still feeling their way. I mean, Syria seems to be turning into a disaster for them. Interestingly, I think actually in the realm of what we might call soft power or culture, it's actually more visible. Um, there's there's a, a a smash hit soap opera on the Turkish telly right now called Muteşem Yüzyıl. We would literally translate it as something like um, the Magnificent Century. It's about the reign of Suleiman. We usually call him the Magnificent in the 16th century, the 1500s. Uh, the Turks have a different name for him. They call him Suleiman Kanuni or Lawgiver. You know, but setting aside the kind of abstruse philosophy of of his reign. What is, of course, really attracting people to this show is the politics of the imperial harem, you know, which is played up for all that it's worth. And in fact, it's a hit not only in Turkey, it's actually become a hit in the Balkans, you know, as far away as countries like Croatia, you know, in the Caucasus, um, in many of the Arab countries, it's become this kind of almost phenomenon. In fact, supposedly, and again, this is just in the realm of rumor, 
we know that the show has actually changed its uh, what we might call visual imprint um, in recent months. And this is in part because both the Turkish government reputedly, in the case of the Prime Minister Erdogan, and apparently some of the Arab viewers, the more influential Arab viewers, objected to the décolletage of the ladies of the Sultan's harem. Oh, really? So suddenly their dress has become more modest and you can actually see it creeping up to the level where it covers even the neck. So you have even live politics now intersecting with what you might call a kind of Ottoman imperial nostalgia. Um, you know, and how that affects the international chessboard, I'm not entirely clear. But there's clearly some kind of a revival going on. You know, the, the same uh, nostalgia for empire is obviously beginning to affect, you might say, popular culture in Turkey. Um, and the, the Turkic-speaking Central Asian republics are, have, you know, post the collapse of the Soviet Union, become political entities in a much you know more meaningful way so yeah. and, and they look to turkey to some extent for language and culture in a way as a counterweight perhaps to moscow and as a counterweight to the west oh and they're drawn to turkey i mean turkey's highly visible present and active in central asia really throughout the russian sphere in terms of things like the construction business and retail and so on but also in the cultural sphere you know having taught in turkey for 10 years i can say you know we draw large numbers of students from the former Soviet Union, particularly from Central Asia, but not exclusively so. Azerbaijan is an obvious kind of origin point, destination point for students coming to Turkey. But this is true actually of a number of groups in the Caucasus, in the Black Sea literal states in the Ukraine. I mean, Turkey is... You know, this is the thing is increasingly, although many people are concerned in the West about its political direction, you know, I understand rightfully so... On the other hand, you have to say certain things really are working. You know, and again, sometimes they work better in the undeclared realms of this soft culture. You know, a kind of a magnet, again, for attracting influence um, or for just attracting people. I mean, it's a magnet even for refugees or for tourists. <laughs> you know, one of the things that a lot of people are either bemused or even to some extent threatened by is the fact that, you know, a huge new sector of the Turkish tourism industry is, of course, being taken up by Arabs, uh, many of whom have money. And in the past, they weren't necessarily drawn to Turkey, but now they are. They feel more comfortable there. It's an Islamic country. You know, they can spend money there and the Turks don't object. <laughs> Oddly enough, the Russians come too, you know, and so you have a kind of meeting of worlds. So I've just been, while you've been talking there about the modern, I was thinking of the, the classic English war memorial in a village somewhere and with the names carved of the dead from the First World War, most villages have 100 or 200 names. Mm. So those guys died because, partly because a war began because the Russians wanted to reconquer Constantinople, mm. which had been lost to Suleiman the Magnificent in 1453. Well, lost to the Byzantines. Lost to the, yeah, lost yeah. To, the, to the Orthodox Christian world 500 years earlier. Right. And, um, and they didn't realise that. They went to their deaths thinking they were fighting for freedom or for abstract concepts against the the Germans, mm -hmm. or, but this whole Eastern view of the war has completely been lost to history, certainly from London. I mean, I, I'm yes. sure in Turkey it's a different, but to hear you talk is a revelation actually about it how is, the it? Eastern question, you yeah. know, triggered the war. You can actually document it. I mean, mm -hmm. if you simply look at the inter-allied agreements, the diplomatic point of the Gallipoli campaign was to win Constantinople and the Straits for Russia. The Russians played hardball in the negotiations, but they were quite clear. In the end, I mean, they even had certain quid pro quos. They said, uh, for example, that we will accept the British protectorate over Egypt so long as you endorse our sovereign claim to Constantinople and the Straits. The French, in some ways, were actually a bit keener. They, they, they caught into the game earlier than the British were. I think this is in part because they knew the Russians better. <laughs> they had much closer relations with the Russians. Now, it was, it was basically the way the French were able to, you know, manipulate out of the inter-allied diplomacy these claims on post-war Lebanon and Syria. You know, they made sure that they had these promises up front. And of course, Britain, I mean, we shouldn't let the British diplomats off the hook. They made their own claims, obviously. And, you know, in the end, Britain obviously did fairly well out of the post-war settlement, although it was not really, again, so much of the diplomatic negotiating table. You know, places like Palestine were won by Britain by force of arms. Um, Arabia, Mesopotamia were won by Britain with force of arms. What was stranger about Constantinople and the Straits, that Russia actually won their claim at the negotiating table. So that literally, obviously, this would have been very surprising to many of the soldiers fighting on the beaches at Gallipoli. 
is that what they were actually fighting for was for Russia's claim to Constantinople. And something very interesting, which you you mentioned last night, was that the Greeks had offered a huge army, uh, several hundred thousand men, to support the Allies in the Gallipoli campaign. But the, the, the Russians vetoed this on the grounds that they didn't want the Greeks getting Constantinople. They wanted to make sure they got it. Clearly and unambiguously, the Russians vetoed any possible Greek involvement in the campaign. Sean, we've let this genie a little bit too far out of the bottle. <laughs> uh, I'm having a lot of problems to get back in again, but we have to um, because we're rapidly running out of time. Uh, do you have a website? Um, my agent has a website. <laughs> I've, well, I've you never haven't got, been terribly you haven't got a good self promotion. That is, I have a page on my agent's website. Uh, okay, Facebook, it? Twitter. Uh, I nope. do have a, a Facebook <laughs> account, one that I don't use terribly. Don't use it. That's not used at all. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, all I will say is that your books will be linked through on the show page. Russian origins of the First World War. You started with the Red Millionaire, didn't you? The Berlin Baghdad Express. A very well known book. That. Yes, I think that one is pretty well known, particularly in the UK. Um, you know, Penguin's done a better job promoting it than some of my American publishers have with my other books. Well, let's, let's hear it for Penguin. I want to say thank you so much. It's been a fascinating, absorbing conversation. Sean and Neil, thank you for joining us for this special edition of Latavia After Dark. We will be back to our abnormal usual on Sunday night. Do join us then. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, Peter. Thank you for having me. 